Servo motors are widely used electromechanical components. For example, they're used in steering systems for scale model helicopters and other radio controlled vehicles, cars, robots, and aircraft, including military drones. A servo motor includes an electric motor, circuitry to control its speed and direction, and gearing to attain the high torques needed to apply moderately large forces over relatively short linear displacements. The gearing inside this servo is a compound gear train with four stages. In this video, we will understand how linear algebra can help us to predict the losses and understand the design trade-offs when converting high speeds and low torques into low speeds and high torques using a gear train. This video is part of the linearity video series. Many complex systems are modeled or approximated linearly because of the mathematical advantages. Hi, my name is Dan Fry, and I'm a professor of mechanical engineering and engineering systems at MIT. Before watching this video, you should be able to identify and describe the forces and torques that act on a system. After watching this video and some practice, you will be able to model the forces and torques in a gear train as a system of linear equations and combine these linear equations into a matrix equation. First, let's get a quick overview of the design. Here's a servo motor with the case opened. Inside the case is a DC motor with a small pinion gear on it. The pinion has 10 teeth and is mated to a gear with 72 teeth. So the first pair provides a speed reduction of 7.2 to 1. This large 72 tooth gear is part of a single molding with a 10 tooth gear. The 10 tooth gear on top of the 72 tooth gear is mated to a plastic gear with 48 teeth as you see here. So that stage provides a speed reduction of 4.8 to 1. The 48 tooth gear is molded to an 11 tooth gear. The 11 tooth gear is mated to a black 36 tooth gear. This 36 tooth gear is molded to a 16 tooth gear. The 16 tooth gear is mated to this black 42 tooth gear, which is splined onto the output shaft. The overall sequence of gear pairs is 10 teeth mated to 72 teeth, 10 mated to 48, 11 mated to 36, and finally 16 mated to 42 teeth on the output shaft. The overall gear ratio is the product of all the gear ratios of the gear pairs in the train. Therefore, about 326 to 1 as shown by this formula. Based on the motor's output and some measurement and calculation, we would expect that an output torque of 6.8 Newton meters in an idealized gear train. But there are frictional losses at every stage of the power transmission process, so we guess the output shaft will provide substantially less torque than that. So let's start by measuring the maximum force at the output shaft and convert that to an output torque. We attach weights to a servo horn that has been connected with an output shaft on the servo motor. An electrical power source, in this case a battery, is connected through a radio controller. Here you see the servo motor lifting one kilogram. Here it is lifting about two kilograms. And here it lifts even three kilograms. This lightweight 100 gram servo motor produces large amounts of torque, which can apparently lift more than 30 times its own weight. In this setup, the servo motor will lift a 4.42 kilogram mass. As the motor lifts the mass, the readout on the scale should change. Here you see the initial weight with slack in the string is 9.75 pounds. This is about 4.42 kilograms. With the motor pulling at maximum capacity, the scale reads 3.7 pounds, which is 1.68 kilograms. A calculation tells us that the maximum torque available at the output shaft, according to our tests, is 1.47 newton meters. We can use linear algebra to work out a better estimate. The force transmission and frictional losses in each step of the train 
can be modeled by a set of linear equations, summing forces and summing torques on the rigid body. For the three rigid bodies that are comprised of two gears molded together, we will need three equations, sums of separate x and y forces and sums of torques. The pinion gear and last gear in the train are simpler because there is only one gear in the body, so we can combine each of those into a single equation. The equations modeling the entire train can be assembled by linking together the five sets of equations with four additional equations to link each mating pair. So the overall system will have 15 equations, three sets of three each, nine total, plus one each for the input and output gears, plus four equations that model the connections between the mating gears. The solution to that set of equations helps us to estimate performance of the machine and also gives us insights into its design. Let's make the model of just one gear body now, say the 11 tooth and 48 tooth molded gear seen here. One way to model the system is to posit that there are four unknown forces acting on this single body of two gears molded together. We can name these forces F, TL2, F, TS2, F shaft X2, and F shaft Y2. The force F TL2 is a force tangent to the gear pitch circle on the larger of the two gears. The T is for tangent, the L is for large, and the two indicates that this is the second compound gear in the train. The force F TS2 is a force tangent to the gear pitch circle on the smaller of the two gears. Again, the T means tangent, and the S here means small. Recall that these tangential forces really come from the forces normal to the gear teeth. These gears are designed so that all the gears in the servo motor have a pressure angle of 20 degrees. So there is an X component to this force, the separation force between the mating gears which has a magnitude given by FTL2 and FTS2 times tangent 0 0.35, where 0 0.35 is 20 degrees expressed in radians. The forces F shaft X2 and F shaft Y2 are the X and Y components of the normal force to the shaft, which is applied to the gear it supports. There are also frictional forces associated with the normal force supporting the shaft, but they are not separate unknowns. The y-direction normal force gives rise to a frictional force in the x-direction with the friction coefficient, mu. Similarly, the x-direction normal force gives rise to a friction force in the y-direction. This completes the description of the unknown forces in our model. Those four forces appear in three different linear equations as represented by this matrix. Take a moment to verify that these equations balance the forces and torques. Pause the video here. The first row in the matrix represents a sum of the forces on the gear in the x direction. The second row represents a sum of the forces on the gear in the y direction. The third row represents a sum of the torques or moments on the gear in the direction parallel to the gear shaft. Now let's work on the model of the next gear in the train, the one with 16 teeth and 36 teeth molded together. Again, we model the system by positing that there are four unknown forces acting on this single body, having two gears molded together and we can name those forces FTL3, FTS3, F shaft X3, and F shaft Y3. And we obtain this matrix. How can we link these two matrices together to get a model of the second and third gears combined? We see that the smaller gear on body two is in contact with the larger gear on body three According to Newton's third law, the reaction force on body two should be equal and opposite to that on body three. 
In fact, the situation is more complex. As the gears enter mating, they slide into engagement. As the gears depart contact, they slide back out. There are losses at the interface that are complex to model, and we will represent them simply using the efficiency in the average transmitted force. Now we can join the model of the second gear and the third gear into a single system of linear equations represented by this matrix. The row in the middle is like glue holding the two models together. The force on the large gear on body three is equal to the force on the small gear on body two, except the penalty is applied for inefficiencies. The principal mechanism for loss of power and torque is sliding friction. In this case, shearing the lubricant on the gear faces. Before going on to assemble more of the model, it's worth inspecting our work so far for patterns. Note that the top right and bottom left of our matrices are filled with three by four matrices of zeros. That is a clue that our matrix is shaping up to be banded in structure. Although every variable affects every other variable, the influences propagate locally in some sense. For example, the frictional losses on shaft two do influence the frictional losses on shaft three, but only indirectly through their effect on the force between the two bodies. Because we arrange the variables in our vectors in a way that respects this structure, our matrix has a band in the middle from the top left corner to the bottom right. We'll try to keep this up as we continue building the model. It will clarify interpretation of the model and also aid in efficiency and stability of the computations needed to solve it. Now it's your turn. Take a moment to write a matrix that models the force and torque balance on the first rigid body gear in the gear train. Pause the video here. This matrix is completely analogous to the matrices we obtained for the second and third gear bodies. When we add the pinion gear and fourth gear into the model, we need to take additional care. These will have slightly different structure. The gear connected to the pinion on the motor has an applied torque due to the motor. The reaction at the output shaft is an externally applied torque due entirely to the large fourth gear. It is possible to combine these into a single equation for each gear. Pause the video and try to write out the linear equations for the pinion and last gear in the gear train. Placing these into the model as the first and last rows, the overall system of linear equations is shown here. Note that the matrix has 15 rows and 15 columns. This should be expected as the system should be neither overdetermined nor underdetermined. Given a particular torque input into the motor, there should be a single value of output torque consistent with our gear train model and its deterministically defined parameters. By solving this system, we find unique values for all the unknowns. When we assemble the equations, we guess the direction of each force in the free body diagram. So it's useful to inspect the solution for negative values. For the parameter values we chose, the reaction force at the shaft of the third body in the x direction turns out to be negative. We should ask ourselves, did we guess wrong about the direction of the force, or is there something wrong with our matrix? Looking at the forces computed, it seems that the friction in the x direction, due to support of the large y reaction on this gear, was more dominant than we expected. It's sensible to run some sanity checks in a case like this. If the friction on that gear were very low, would the sign be positive as expected? We ran that scenario and the sign did become positive. So our guess about the direction of the reaction force was wrong. Our assumption for the magnitude of the friction was too low. But it seems the model is behaving in reasonable ways. Now that we have a reasonable level of confidence in the model, 
we can begin to use it to explore the design decisions that the engineers made. If we put in reasonable values for the gear mating efficiency, such as 96%, and reasonable values for the friction coefficients at the bushings, such as 0.3, we find an overall efficiency of the gear train is about 52%. This is in reasonable agreement with our simple measurements. We found that the maximum torque available at the output shaft is 1.47 Newton meters, which would imply an efficiency closer to 25%. But our measurement used an overhanging load, which caused the shaft to bend. Our simple model makes a large and optimistic assumption of loading the servo motor with torques only. It's not surprising that the answers differ substantially. It suggests installing the servo so that bending loads are supported elsewhere, not in the servo itself. The gears in automotive transmissions with similar ratios are much more efficient, perhaps 90% to 95% efficient. But for a compact and inexpensive gear train, this design performs well. To summarize, we built an engineering model of a servo motor gear train using systems of linear equations. Building this model was a challenge and took some time. But now that we have this 15 by 15 matrix, a computer can solve it easily. Now you're free to imagine all sorts of what-if scenarios to explore the relationships among the variables and improve the design. We hope this video inspires you to use linear algebra to improve your engineering designs.